On an early summer day on April 3rd, Tom came home to find a mysterious box at his doorstep. Inside the box was a string of numbers. The number tells Tom the exact date he'd die. Yet, it's not just Tom. Across the globe, from suburban doorsteps to desert tents, everyone found identical boxes waiting for them. On June 1st, most people opened the box they were given. By December 31st, the world had settled into a new reality. The life before the string was once perceived as fair, more or less. You believe if you eat healthy, exercise often, and try hard at what you do, then maybe you get to live life the way you want. You live long and prosper. But now it seemed to be a cruel, tasteless joke. Some people celebrated upon learning they had a lot of time left, perhaps until their 80s or 90s. Some, on the other hand, have little. They have a few years, a few months, and for some unfortunate souls, only a few weeks left. Like Tom. As divided as they are, they share one thing in common. Death has never been more real. The world before the string is a world that does its best to hide death. We place cemeteries far away from where we live. We speak of death in euphemisms. We follow guides and gurus and products to help us live longer. For as long as we can, death remains obscure at the far back of our minds. But not now. Death now loomed unmistakably tangible and precise. Eventually, with a long string or a short string, people started living in five separate ways. The first group was that of ignorance. They just don't believe the string. Nothing can make them to. They think the string was a big fat hoax, coordinated by a shadow government agency to put more control on people. They refuse to see life as pointless, meaningless, and a big heap of nothingness. So they continue their life as usual, without thinking about death. Some even refuse to open the box and keep on living like before. Those might be the luckiest and most sane people on earth. Then there are folks who decide it's time to pursue what makes them happy, to pursue pleasure, these are the second group, who live out of Epicureanism. Despite the hopelessness of life, they seize each moment with newfound clarity. We've always said that you only live once, and you should make the best out of it. But not until the string appears does this cliché verbose turn into an existential guidance. They strip their life of things that don't matter. They quit their job, sell their house, make friends, make love, and spend more time with their families. They travel, dance, read all the books they say they want to read for the past five years, try as many new restaurants as they can, and try their best to make every moment worth it. However, not all decide to settle for a peaceful end. Some turn into sensations junkies, addicted to feeling more, to feel the extremes of ecstasy and agony. They live in unquenchable gluttony, in relentless hedonism, insatiable lust, or spiraling gluttony. They reason that between now and the day you die, you have the freedom to do anything without fear of death. So there's no longer good or bad, just obsession for the extreme. Then there comes the third group, one that is of strength and ferocity. They feel like God is playing a joke on them, an evil joke of absurdity. So they do what requires the most strength and energy. They end the stupid joke. Having understood that it is better to be dead than to be alive, that it is best of all not to exist. They act accordingly since there are always means. A rope around one's neck, water, fire, a forever sleep, a bridge at midnight, a knife to stick into one's heart, or a train to lie under. But not all have the same strength. Some, consumed by resentment, become agents of chaos. They lash out, intent on dragging others into their abyss of despair, out of rage, out of frustration, out of maddening hopelessness. They bomb, they rob, they torture, they murder, they sabotage. Knowing they die anyway, they seek to enforce their own justice, to imprint their pain onto the world. They refuse to suffer in isolation. The fourth way that people live is to live miserably, knowing that life is a stupid joke played upon them, knowing that they'll die soon and still go on living trapped in a cycle of self-hatred, apathy, and despair. But not enough to end the whole thing. They move through life with minimal effort. They withdraw, retreat into themselves. They wake, eat their small, sad meal, watch their brief, dull entertainment, alone. 
all alone in their small, dark space, waiting, just waiting for the end of the day, to do it all over again, repeat the sad routine, repeat the endless wait. At first, there are only these four ways, but then, there eventually comes the fifth way, to live by faith. This faith is not confined within doctrines and practices of organized religion. It's a belief in the vast, unknown cosmic orders that shape our existence, in forces that are bigger than all of us, and if the string tells them the exact date they'll die, so be it. They accept that they play a role, however short, in the grand scheme of things. This acceptance does not render them passive. Instead, it gives them purposes. To live their remaining days with hope, some put faith in compassion, in love, in the simplicity of everyday life. Some put faith in science. They believe that one day we might boldly go where no man has gone before, and seek out the reason behind all of this. And they believe that the future, no matter how short or long it is, belongs to those who have hope. Because after all, hope keeps us alive.